Or you want to pledge it? Uh, sure. Okay. If everyone join us with the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thanks for coming. We're just going to shuffle the deck roll today. Uh, we're going to have, uh, have a representative from Avatar here. We don't want to keep him too long. Appreciate that. And uh, he's going to explain the process. Uh, when you say process, because I wasn't exactly told what the... Uh, we, we thought Jonathan was coming with you, too. Uh, uh, me, too. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, he has a whole spiel he's, he's... Okay, is it the process for just data verification that you're just looking for? Essentially, the, the points you... of contact, like how are our folks contacted yeah. when their uh, property is going to be looked at, okay. via, like, letter, yep. physical... Follow up letters, or that kind of thing. So, a typical year for us is in the beginning of the year, we're going to do any permits and new construction. So, starting from February to April, we're going to anyone's home that has pulled a permit or has pulled a permit in the past and the work is still yet to be completed. So, if you had pulled a permit in 17 or 18 um, and we've gone to the home and it, we're still under construction or you hadn't gotten to actually starting the permit process yet, like you pulled a permit for the garage haven't actually started it, uh, we would flag that to go back to. Um, those particular people don't receive any sort of notification because it's commonly known that if you pull a permit, you're going to get visited. Um, later, so they don't get notified? They do not. Okay, okay, so you automatically go to that house? Correct. If they pull a permit? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and we will continue to go until, um, it's one of those kind of subjective things. We'll continue to go um, for a certain period of time, um, but if it's like, We've been going there for five years, and either the garage hasn't been started, we're going to say, all right, well, now they need to pull another permit if they're going to do something. Um, or we'll just flag it for, you know, the next week up. Yeah. Um, if it's something that uh, we've been going to for year over year, and it's like they haven't finished the bathroom uh, drywall or something of that sort, we'll probably, because what flags those properties is a depreciation, um, temporary. If we've been going there for eight years and nothing's changed, we'll probably move that depreciation to something more physical, in which case it will stop getting flagged to go to year after year. Um, and then when we do the reval, we might look at that and say, all right, well, let's see if they'll come in and talk to us and we'll send a letter. Um, after that February to April process of doing permits, that's when we start the DV, the data verification for that year. Um, and the way that that process works right now in your contract, we've changed things going forward because we have uh, other towns um, request us send mail prior to actually going to the property. But the way your contract is working right now is that um, we're going to visit 20% of the town each year um, and we start that process without notifying the homeowner. So we'll go to the property, knock on the door. Um, if it's posted, meaning that say somewhere along their driveway or out front it says uh, no trespassing, we'll drive up, knock, ask for permission. If no one answers or no one's home, We'll immediately leave. We won't do anything on that property. Um, if we drive up and there isn't any no trespassing signs and no one's home, we'll still knock, see if anyone's there to ask questions or give us permission. Um, but if no one answers, we'll then just verify exterior measurements. So we'll walk up to sheds, measure the sheds, measure the exterior of the house, leave a door hanger, notify why we were there, um, and then leave. During that visit, we'll mark the card as either uh, measured. Um, or estimated, if there are some parts of the house that we couldn't get to either because of growth or a fenced-in area, uh, measure M or E will later in the summer when we do the query to send out letters to people. Um, those are the properties that get the, the notification that said, hey, we were there during the summer, no one is home, would you like to call this phone number and make an appointment to, to do interior information? Um, that's really, at this point, that's the real only letter that someone will get. Um, during that summer period, if we go to the house and we knock and someone is home, we'll ask them to do that interior at that time. Uh, they can say no, uh, I'd rather you not. They can ask us to leave, we'll leave. Um, or they can say no, I don't want you inside, but you're more than welcome to measure. So we'll market that down as a measure, but a uh, homeowner uh, would like an appointment. So they'll yes. still get a letter. Just to be clear, you're, you're very uh, conscious that this is voluntary and you share that, you know, with the, whoever comes to the door, that they they are informed that it's clearly a voluntary thing. There's no uh, absolutely, ambiguity in the process. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. We don't 
I mean, we're coming unannounced. So our position is it's, it's your property. If you don't want us there, we'll leave. If there's any point where someone feels uncomfortable, we're, we're not going to push anyone to do anything they don't want to do. Absolutely not. Well, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear for the folks who probably watched the film, right? so that they know that they don't have to, there's no pressure on them, it's probably to their benefit in some cases, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the past, um, not our company, but it has been common practice for assessors where, like, if you don't get inside, estimate something, because it's not fair to the people that do let you in, um, and you do verify absolutely everything, that the ones that don't could possibly get away with not being assessed. <clears throat> Fairly. We don't do that so much, but when we do um, reevaluation, so like let's say let's say this year we do a reevaluation and I'm driving by your house and I notice that we haven't been in for ten years, at that point I'll assume some changes have been made inside, meaning you've made updates, whether you've updated uh, bathrooms, painted floors, that sort of thing, and I'll make an adjustment then. And the reason I feel comfortable doing that is because you get a letter as a part of that reevaluation saying this is what your new value is. And you have enough time to make an appointment before we even do the finalization of values. Um, so that's that's why we do it then. So you you have a point where you can look at the value and say, this this has gone off. This doesn't make sense to me. You can come and tell us, and then we'll go through and make an interior inspection and verify everything. Um, that's really the only time that we'll make drastic estimate estimations on someone's property, um, unless there's something very visibly obvious that there have been changes made. And then um, if somebody contacts you because of these letters, they just invite you back, you go in and assess it, so you call and make appointments, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the uh, reval year, is, is there anything different that takes place, any other contacts in a reval year? That so typically in a reval year, we, we make it so that we're not visiting properties in that year except for... Uh, new construction. So there is no data verification in the year of the reval because we don't want people constantly getting letters from us um, and confusing them because if you're getting letters for data verification and getting letters for the reevaluation, it can get cumbersome. And, um, so during the reevaluation here, there's typically no new construction or no, sorry, no data verification done. Um, so the only letters they're going to get at that point is a preliminary notice. So um, when Jonathan, would probably be Jonathan and I, um, when we finish all our spreadsheets, we drive the whole town, and we feel like we've come up with a very solid um, preliminary analysis completed, we'll send out the letters, notify people that this is their preliminary value, this is where we're standing right now, um, and I'll have that number to call and make an appointment if they feel like we've made an error in some way. Um, or if they just want to come down and talk and figure out, you know, how do we get to that value. Um, that's that point to come down and meet with us. We'll make changes if we think there are some that need to be made. Um, it's also a good time to do it because if you do come in and we find out there are issues that we'd like to go out and verify, we, you, we have someone here to do that that same day. So if you're taking time out of your day, you don't have to take another day to do it. We can do it right then and there. Um, but yeah, there's just that two letters. It's the preliminary notice and then it's the final notice of value um, once our job is completed, usually right around September. <clears throat> okay, yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Typically, it's in the fall when you you block out three or four days for people to come in and yeah. you know get the verification from you, the how, the why. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, what else was I thinking about that? Um, oh, just, well, just take the average home. It's not under construction. There's nothing unusual going on. Um, the points of contact would be to go, one, and knock on the door. You're there to measure and all like that. And then... What would follow after that? Would there be any kind of, is there a letter that... If no one's there? Yeah. Yeah, they'll receive a letter in the summer. Right. Notifying, notifying them that we're there and that um, either no one is home, if you'd like to call and make an appointment, uh, use this number during this period of time to call and make an appointment so that we can come out to the property and view the interior. And then essentially you're, you're done with the contacts unless you get... Right, they should see us again for, or hear from us again for another five years, theoretically. Unless a permit is pulled at the property, right. or if the property were to sell. So say next year with the revaluation, yeah. um, we're going to go and visit Indeed. most of, if not all, of the sale properties. So um, for two reasons. One, to try and make sure the information that we have is accurate about the property, so we're not misinformed in our model as we do our analysis <coughs> as to what physically existed at the time of the sale. Um, also to try and gain more information from 
the taxpayer or homeowner about the sale. So we're looking to find the conditions of the sale, if there were any special considerations, if they knew the prior owner prior to the sale, you know, anything that would indicate it wasn't a true indicator of market value um, in terms of the assessing standard, what we would normally look for. Okay. Um, well, I don't have any other questions. No, 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 I'm good. Does anybody in the audience want to direct something in their direction? Mr. Strauss. Yeah. Hi, Dave Strauss. Uh, I have three things that actually affect our assessed value. As you know, obviously, that's a major factor in our school calculation. Um, this last year, the business, lakes, view property is a major driver of our town. Now, I'll start with the business. You were 75% off on a recent business that was sold, which happened to be a camp front. And lakes, current property sold on lakes within the last year are 30 to 38 percent below us, sold above assessed value. We just recently had a view property that had been on the, on the market for over seven years, sold for 40 percent below assessed value. How do you factor that in to our overall assessed value when you actually do this next year? Want to do the reval? Yes. Are we doing, are we doing the next year. So, I mean, all those sales are going to be looked at. So when we're doing our spreadsheets, we have different categories. So obviously the commercial properties are in a spreadsheet all their own because they should be mixed in with residential. There'd be a view spreadsheet, and then there'd be a waterfront or lakefront uh, spreadsheet. So typically what we do in our process is we'll look at all the residential sales, the land sales being land only, so there's no improvement to the property. And we kind of derive those base values. So what is the base rate for a house um, per square foot and the base rate for a typical two acre, three acre property in town. Once we derive those, we then can use those in those other spreadsheets. So if we know what the buildings are selling for, what is a commercial piece of land worth that's above what a residential land is selling for? And that's kind of how we get the factor for commercial properties. And it's the same thing for views and um, waterfront uh, with a little bit more into it because we're trying to make it um, as objective as possible when it comes to, you know, what are you looking at for views? What are you looking at? How much of it? How far away is it? Uh, with waterfront, it's where are you on the waterfront? How much do you have? Um, is the waterfront level to the water with the beach or not? Um, those factors get kind of put into place on those spreadsheets. So when we use the base rate for the building, base rate for the land, it's calculating what a normal property would sell for, and what's left over is attributed to the view or the waterfront. And those factors, we're trying to make those factors work so that the, so the, num that the number they're deriving is our base value. So the views might be all worth different values for each sale, but based on our factors we're using, we're hoping that, that the base view value might come up to 25000 for everyone or 50000 for everyone. So you're not basing it off the high value sale? Uh, no, I mean, those sale values are used to derive that end value. That base value? Right, so we're not using the assessment to come up with the values. The assessment's not even in that spreadsheet. It's the base rate for the building that we've derived in those other spreadsheets to come up with the building value, <coughs> subtract it from the sale price. The base rate for the land value, you subtract that from the sale price, and what's left with is a view. So you are factoring in the sales, recent sales on similar type properties. Oh, absolutely. That's the only so, thing we're So I would expect when I go back and look on the next year's reval, you would be taking that into effect, into effect for our businesses of campgrounds of that sold, of view properties and waterfront properties. You would be taking in those recent sales of that based on the base, and obviously you have other factors that you take off, but you are looking at those. Correct. Which yep. should affect the overall assessed value. Absolutely. Okay, yep. thank and you. We need to take those, the, whatever situations that surround those sales may be, um, into consideration as well. So in some cases, something strange may happen with the transfer of a property, um, which may need, we would need to take into consideration. Um, but yes, we would be considering all those sales. And anyone else? Well, so.
So now everyone's clear on assessing. <laughs> or <laughs> assessing one on one. Or yeah. at least we. But I would, I'd, I'd like to encourage everyone to come down when we do that reevaluation and you get that letter. If there are any questions, come down and talk to us. I mean, uh, we have all the spreadsheets, we have everything there. We'll try to explain everything we can to you. And if we find that there's an issue, we'll try to correct it as best we can. I mean, I, our job is to make sure we're being fair and equitable to everyone. Um, we don't get paid more or less one way or the other. We just want to make sure it's right. Um, so we urge everyone to, I mean, that's why we do the process. The preliminary hearings are really something that uh, we push for all our towns to do so that we can fix mistakes before they become finalized. So. It uh, should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway, is that anybody, everybody, should continue to come in on a yearly basis and look at their tax card and verify that the information on your tax card matches your property, whether it's acreage or the structures on there, to monitor if there's been changes and we haven't captured that. So that's an ongoing process that the homeowner should be looking at. And I should also note that if any homeowner is ever questioned or questioning when we've gone to the property, there is a listing history. So anytime a representative from Avatar has ever gone to the property, there's a listing history that shows you the date um, and who was there. So if anyone's ever questioning, you know, have they been out to my property and when was it, they can easily look that up. Uh, and I'm glad you guys uh, came in because yeah. this is a... The process of just the visits and the letters um, isn't common knowledge to everyone how it works, what their options are. So I really, uh, the board appreciates you, you folks yeah. coming in here to explain it and that uh, Mr. Como is here with uh, government oversight capturing this on film so at least people can uh, view this around town at a later date and couldn't be here right? Can a synopsis, or do they have that? Who are you, ma'am? I can't oh, see excuse you Excuse me, here. Carol Fister-Stevens. Well, uh, can they have a, a synopsis of that on the website for us, for people? Yeah, I think we I mean, you know, something. a little two-page something. A lot of people, you know, don't get the chance to watch, but if it's in writing somewhere, maybe they'll read it and understand a little better if it's on the website. Uh, well, a link or something, I don't know. Yeah, I think we have a... I think we do actually have an explanation that we've been handing out. So, like, put up, you know, so okay. yeah. Avatar 101, you know, nothing with big work. <laughs> um, certainly through perhaps the office we can connect you with our uh, web guru yes. and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, get that on there. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Um, and again, this will be able to view this anyway, the town's folks, through this meeting. So I appreciate you uh, sharing the steps that it takes because it is... Apparently confusing uh, for some, and, and you know it's always helpful to get the information out. I think Ed wants to. Yeah. Does the uh, state audit your process at all? Ed? Oh yes, absolutely. So um, every year that we do the data verification, the state will go out and take a sampling of that and verify that we're doing what we say we're doing. Um, and then if there are any issues with that, they send a report to the town. Um, so if there were issues found, you guys would have known about it by now. Um, they also audit our reevaluation, so they'll go through and make sure that all our spreadsheets, our manual is saying what was done, and they check the computer to make sure that they both correlate. So what we say we did in the manual also happens to be what was the camera system is doing locally on the computer. Um, the other thing they do is a cyclical review. Um, that's sometimes it falls on the year of the reevaluation. Sometimes it's it's every five years, but it might not coincide with the reevaluation. And that's when they actually they'll come into the town and they'll check random sampling of current use uh, properties to make sure that the town is doing their job of keeping the current use uh, records. They'll check vet credits, elderly. They go through everything, and it's a small sampling of each, but they just go through a random sampling to make sure that the town has got um, a good handle on things. So they really kind of check everything. Um, and there's a specific monitor. Do you know who it is? Uh, I think there was a change. I'm not sure at the present moment. I can get you the information. But there's a, usually a specific DRA, uh, Department of Revenue Administration, um, supervisor or monitors, what they usually go by, um, specific for each community that you can contact. Because they're also there not only for oversight, but also questions. You know, if there's ever uh, an issue with, you know, how do we do this? Uh, timber tax on this property, or what should we do? They're always another that source. something to put on the website. Yeah. The um, they also, and that this also can create confusion <clears throat> with taxpayers, they also will send out, during that random sampling, they will send out postcards to homeowners 
prior to visiting, uh, stating that basically um, we're going to be going to the property to do a data verification check on your contracted uh, firm that's doing your assessing. If you, and I believe it's one of those things where if you don't want us to come to the property, please call this number and tell us you'd like to opt out. If we don't hear from you, we assume it's okay, visit your property and then they'll go out. Um, so potentially homeowners that we visit one year could also get a second visit from the state, oh. um, which adds to the confusion because sometimes they'll tell us that we've been there twice and it was really the state that was that second time. So, so that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that may have happened in the past to add to some of the ongoing confusion. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Regal, you yeah. Is how do you guys uh, address any uh, uh, properties that have been deemed to be wetlands? So the question is, how do we deal with the value of the property? How do you, yeah, how do, you, uh, how do you address that? It depends. So, typically, um, we should have addressed it by now if the property is that wet. Um, but if it's something that um, is new or has been ongoing, we just weren't aware of it, uh, we we'll usually check aerial photographs, check to see how wet it's, it looks, if there are surveys that show areas of wetness and then we'll depreciate the basically the area of that wetness down. How, would, how would the uh, how would the landowner know where the uh, boundaries are that you've done because uh, mine in particular was when I built the house uh, most of my property was deemed to be wetlands it couldn't be built on I only had a postage stamp to build on because of wetland delineation mm -hmm. and uh, I look back and I sent a uh, I sent a reval card in last year to have it checked because I believe that it was uh, too much normal land was I was being taxed for. Um, I'd like to know where you folks are going to determine where, if and when and where my wetlands are. I think if, that might be a potential. Just jump in here, look. Um, if if I was in a situation like Steve is, and I'm contesting that I have X amount of acreage and it's, in my opinion, wet, coming in here to in the fall to uh, essentially contest your, your evaluation, um, that a lot of the onus could be on the property owner at that point to prove to you. Would that be the case? Like if you had somebody that could delineate the wetlands. No, I, it was delineated for me by the uh, by the Effingham Commission. When I when I pulled the permit to build, they come out and they put all sorts of pink ribbons everywhere around my property. Said on well, the Conservation you, Commission. Yeah, you can't build here. So that to me says if I can't build on it, if I can't use it in that respect, then right. it shouldn't be taxed the same way as buildable land. Right. I, I would think that if you had that information from the Conservation Commission to present to Avatar, essentially you could, you potentially would adjust or how, how? Yeah, no, I think the short answer to your question is yes, we adjust for wetlands. We just have to have some sort of documentation to support that. So whether it's would pictures the Conservation of... Conservation Commission have uh, records of this? Well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't know that, but potentially that's, if they went on your property, hopefully they do. Hopefully, I don't know. Yeah, hopefully. Right. And I would remind people at this point that there's an abatement process. If you feel something has been uh, valued inappropriately, if, if you put an abatement in by the given period, that triggers a visit from Avatar. Correct. To and go out and check and explain to you why certain things are valued. But I would or so, correct it. But in order to do that, I'd have to know what these guys are saying is what land and isn't. It would be that's the first step. Yeah, it would be indicated on your card. So on your land card, on your landline, on the so if you're looking at your property record card, at the very bottom is all the land information. Yeah. Uh, somewhere on, I don't know how many landlines you have, but somewhere on there, there should be a designation or a note that says wet. If we if we are depreciating your property for wetness, there should be a note that says wet, and there will be a condition associated with it. But there's no. Um, and I know you're not surveyors, but there's no general rule of thumb of from this point to the stone wall, from this point to the stone wall, whatever. 
is wet because you're just looking at it going, yeah, where are they talking about? Uh, no, so if, if we've got a survey, we'll obviously break out the land. So like let's say you have two acres and 90, 0.93 acres is wet. We'd break it right out and say 0.93 acres wet, 10 condition, and break it out. If we have accurate data, if it's something that we're just going and looking at, we'll probably just depreciate it on that one landline and say, you know, area is wet and then depreciate. Um, if we've got aerials and we can very easily see where those wetlands are, we'll calculate it using the Google Earth um, and break it out similar to a survey, um, but we'd put an estimate, estimate area wet. My problem is my stuff is, is seasonably wet on both sides of my property. I have about five acres. I only have like an acre and a half that's considered building. All right? So when you go out there, it may, to you, it may look dry, it may look beautiful, but it isn't because in late fall and into uh, almost to the end of spring, it's wet. Yeah, I was so you, you're going to be out there in the summer going, wahoo, it's dry. Well, I'll take pictures of it. Take pictures of it and have it ready for us. I mean, because I'm mean, assuming it's wet now, right, in the spring? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I take pictures of it now and just have it ready for us when we do the reval. Yeah, they, they essentially need something to go by. Yeah, you know, this they, is what I'm asking. Yeah, bring, bring them something like pictures or anything from the Conservation Commission, should it exist, to delineate your property. Or for some people, if they had a lot of property or something, a big concern, maybe it's worth it for them to hire someone to delineate the wetlands in an accurate manner to present them. Uh, That's what they need something to some pictures. But just as you're saying, when we do the reevaluation process, there are certain things <clears throat> we can't know unless we're told. So that's part of that process too, is to gather as much information about each property as we can to ensure that we're accurately taking every consideration into account yeah, that well, I was a buyer or homeowner. The purpose of me speaking up was to find out what steps yep. need to be okay, done yeah. to get there. Yep. Who, who the owners was. All right. Yep. And we're always happy to review any concerns or questions because, you know, we can't know everything. We'd love to, but <laughs> it's always a constant learning process. <laughs> but communication, and, and that's why you folks are in, that's pretty much why we asked you in, is to get some dialogue and some communication and some understanding of the process out there for folks, you know. Uh, like Steve and Dave uh, have individual concerns that, that they're not alone in those concerns, I'm sure. Uh, um, Is everybody here satisfied? As best you can be. As best you can. <laughs> As we're putting these guys on the spot tonight. Yeah. And they're doing a great job. All right. Well, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for coming in. I appreciate everything you do. Have a good rest of your meeting. You too. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. you too. Of course we um, I think we have members from the, uh, our employees from the transfer station who had um, some issues that can come up. Not that there are issues almost every day over there, I imagine they come up, but enough that, so they prompted them to come in. Yes, I'm Bill Rabel. I live on uh, Huntress Bridge Road, oh, and I am here with my fellow employee. I'm off with the LOC, the transfer station. These two guys are going to be better known than most anybody else in the town. You know <laughs> yes, we are. Okay. Uh, we have a great deal of bulk waste and bulk coming in, as you are all aware. On Wednesday morning this past week, we had three, were they all 40 yarders? Yeah, uh, two 40 yarders, one 30 yarder. Two 40 yarders and one 30 yarder. And they were empty Wednesday morning. By Wednesday afternoon, one was practically full, another was about a quarter full. By the close of business on Sunday, all three were completely full. Yeah. Now the issue that we're, we're facing is that it's costing the town a lot of money to get rid of this stuff, and people are just getting in for their buck. Yeah. You know, we are charging for white goods and tires Heard. and electronics, that sort of thing. That's already set in motion. But what we need to do, and we have discussed this before, is we need to set down some initial prices on disposal for truckloads, mattresses, mattresses couches, 
cushion chairs, recliners. So I have taken liberty to just kind of put together a little bit of an idea of what we might consider charging. And it's no, by no means you know, set in stone. You can review it. And we can have some place to start working. Is it, is it a survey for you? Chuck has taken a survey, which we are aware he's going to do, comparing other towns in the area, and we can see where we're going from there. And, and I'd like to bring up, in this whole district, and even across the board, you're the only town that does not charge the bulky wages. Yeah, and I know we talked about this, and you're, well, first I'm going to point out that when you're saying 30 and 40 yarders, you're referring to our dumpsters, so everybody yeah, knows what we're talking about. And, and Mark, you conveyed to me that you've been at our transfer station for 14 well, months, was it? No, about 14 years. 14 years, okay. About 14 years. So oh, you, you kind of have a handle on the flow yeah, then, it's, huh? Uh, it's increasing, it's been increasing over the years. Uh, we come up with a rule, only one truck load per day. Okay, it was working great, but some people were bringing a load every day, plus a trailer load. And, it, it, you know, getting out of hand. And then when you get up on, you can't. What I try to explain to them, I said, you have to back off a little bit this week. Because there's other people in town, which maybe once or twice a year, they only bring some bulky waste in. Toward the end of the week, they come rolling in. I'm sorry, I can't take this. I can't take this stuff. I gotta take it back home. Oh. Which they get upset. <laughs> which, which I would. Well, I um, uh, what I did last year when I got on the, the yeah. board in this lofty position, and Claudia knows I spent a couple of yeah. days going through the uh, billing for the transfer yeah. station. So in uh, 2016 and 17, it was averaging out to probably be about $40,000 worth of cost. Uh, some years are higher than that. It sounds like we're on track for a banner year here. Um, so one of the things we had noticed with other commodities was that we had a a decrease in items that were coming to our transfer station once there was a cost for them. Because I think, as you have pointed out, we're a, a little oasis in the surrounding towns of we're not charging for things. So I imagine it's human nature that if you have a friend in Effingham, maybe your couch finds its way here versus somewhere else where they charge. Um, I mean, I would do it if I lived in that thing. Throw my truck, and I'll take it over. Human neighbor. Uh, Mr. Eagle. Yeah. I just want to make a comment because yeah. I was at the uh, transfer station last Wednesday, and I and while I was there, for the five minutes I was there, I saw two pickup trucks with at least 10-foot trailers, both of them loaded to the gills, wow. two, two sets of them. Right there, Thank piled you. up, and I thought that was wrong. I thought that you had yeah, already we, we had we had set a uh, half a, a level pickup right Oh no, low. this was oh, past no. the roof of the pickup. Certainly, the trailers was was in your purview oh, to send yeah, folks that's what away. I'm no, they they don't want to listen, do they? Go? They don't want to listen. Well, can you take down the licenses? This is this is. Yeah, well, that's what our next step. I mean, this is what I've been saying to you, though, for a while now, is take the license plate numbers, because I understand from talking with you, coming down, visiting you guys, that there's these interactions that seem to take place on a weekly basis of things being dropped off because somebody's huffy and just lands it there, whether it's a dryer or some other commodities, oh, yeah, yeah. and off they go. Um, and I, I want you to know that take the license plate down, the number, and let Claudia know in the office. Because the transfer station is like a driver's license. It's a privilege. It's not a right. And quite frankly, I don't think you guys, and I'm pretty sure Chuck and John will agree, need to be taking a lot of guff from people that you're, you're servicing, you're helping out down there um, by, the, by some of the behavior that's been well, Bill, explained. 
tongue lasted just this week. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he ain't there to be bad about it. Nobody is. Nobody is. Yeah. And uh, and I spoke to the man. I got the same attitude. But I said, look, you're going to do it. You're going to, you're going to sit there, and next time you come back, you're going to pay for it. He said, he had no money. I said, look, going to sit right there. He went home and got the money. But that took a couple of weeks. And did it, it took not? two weeks. But he took advantage of a situation, though, I already talked to you about. So there again, I think what we really need to do if we're going to change the behavior is we have you guys uh, take the plate numbers down. They've got a permit, so they're, you know, from us, they're in here. And um, we can get them a letter or put them on a list to not renew their permits or send them a letter letting them know that they're getting warning A uh, out of C, I don't know, to whatever the deemed necessary for the behavior at the time, um, and their their rights, uh, privilege will be revoked if, you know, if it comes to that. Yeah, we we should, don't want it we to. We have said that to them before. Well, maybe a letter from us would be a little well, different. But the first thing gets thrown at, in our face, what is that? I'm a taxpayer. You can't do that to me. Well, well they, yeah. we can't. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope the people realize, I mean, it's, we're there to help them and educate them. And in what you tell us to do, we're there to do. That's my job and his job. Not to be torn down and harassed. Well, this is, this is the idea, Marcus. We, we don't want you guys to be subjected to that. And nobody needs to be, it shouldn't be, and it shouldn't be allowed um, because it's just going to propagate that same kind of attitude. So again, I can't express this enough, yeah. that if you can get us the information we need, we will, yeah. we will reach out and inform those offenders that there needs to be an attitude change or they will lose their privileges. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm the bulky, bulky way. It's a very big cost. It has to be, right, Claudia? A big cost in the town? Yes. Okay. Even if we have to charge, you charge a little bit to offset the trucking, the tonnage, you know, at least do a little bit. Because I mean, right now, it's 100% cost in this town. Well, you know, uh, I think. I don't, I think the way we've handled it, or other boards have handled it in the past, has been that there are certain things that were coming in, whether there are lots of tires, uh, and they're not coming from everyone. So there was a cost put to that, and a lot of that got reduced because there was an abuse taking there place. Was abuse on the tires. And then uh, again, say refrigerators with coolant or other white uh, goods, you know, dryers and stoves, um, we weren't charging. Uh, now we are, and I think there's probably been a reduction in, yes, in those. So uh, I think it's probably time, seeing as we're the only ones not charging for bulky waste, that we will need to look at this. Obviously, you've spotted a trend uh, that's coming out of the bottom line. And um, I was in favor of trying, if we could have had a better situation, I would have been looking at uh, a, a scale. We don't have the room for it. But then we could have really, you know, accurately charged for what comes in. But I know that other towns are making do with uh, another method. And, um, mm -hmm. Can I interrupt you? Yes. Remember we way back, John, you come up with a plan? I don't know. I can't believe it. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, you, this has been no, recast. No, no, no. I remember you, you had the same issue came up way back. When you come up, uh, so much for this, so much for that. I remember that really well. And I don't know what happened. It just fell away to the wayside. I don't, it's not your fault. It just happened. Yeah, I think, well, I think, well, well you guys. Because I remember you did a lot of study on it. I just, we, yeah, we didn't, 
we didn't want to force it too much right. at the time. Yeah. We were going to take baby steps yeah. and see how it played out. Yeah. But I do know that I, I, in the past, I'm, not sh I, I'm almost certain we used to have four dumpsters. Now we cut it down to three. Well, we did, trying to contain. Yeah. That's when we cut down what yeah. people could bring in because yeah. the cost was escalating. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and they, we, how much any individual yeah, could bring yeah, in, and yeah. after that, they were to be notified that they were going to have to handle that waste on their own. And, and that was part of what I found, is we had a year that was somewhere around $44,000, and then there was the next uh, following year was, I don't know, let's say $10,000 less, $34,000 yeah. in the bulky waste demo. But that's essentially what we were doing, is we weren't providing the service anymore, we were sending people away, which probably isn't the best thing. So if we're charging, if that's what we do, then uh, and if we need to have more containers out there, we'll have to see if we can fit them. And in you get one more, yeah, probably one when more we, container. When we cut, cut down on the containers, it was so that somebody could man that station yeah. and see exactly what was There's coming in on the trucks truck. and say, whoa. That's the, it was the yeah. area that we were covering so much area with those containers that people, if they were told they couldn't put it in here, were driving further along and throwing it in the next container. So that's that's where the idea of bringing the yeah, narrowing down. exactly narrowing down the space where that that can, can both these would well, we we can certainly um, consider options there. We have another gentleman working for us, and when you consider the amount of money that we're talking about. If we had to have another individual there, it would certainly more than cover that person's um, involvement for that time period. So, um, I, I think this is pretty serious uh, financial situation. I looked at it in the past. We also want the people in the town to have a service, and there's certainly people who, you know, once every five, ten years might have their grandsons come and take a coach to the transfer station for them and never use the bulky waste. Um, and then we have people who probably are there on a monthly basis because of whatever it is they are involved. Well, you know, and I don't care that they come in every month or every week if they're paying their fair share of the, for this service. Um, and I think there's a lot involved with, with paying. We have to come up with a, a structure where it's accountable because now it's revenue. Right. It's a whole, it's not just hand a piece of paper and say, okay, we're going to start charging. That's not going to happen. We, we, we're going to need a register that prints it. Is. There's a whole, oh, yeah. there's yeah. a process to go through. Yeah. You know, it, it's just not as easy as, okay, we're going to start charging. Yeah, and I think that's what's kind of put the brakes on trying to find other ways around it yeah. in the past. But yeah. so, it I mean, looks I'm, like that doesn't there, there are ways to come up with this process. process. That's not yeah. insurmountable. Well, yeah. I'm not saying it is. It is, but I'm saying that there has to be a lot more thought put into this process, and not just say, "Correct." Yeah, we're going to do it. There's got to be more thought. In, input on it. Well, not input. Uh, yeah, from yeah, from us. I mean, accountability from a financial yeah, standpoint. Yeah, exactly. That kind of revenue coming in. Yeah, right. Because that so, would be a significant amount yeah, of money. Exactly. Being so, I mean. I, I don't, for me personally, I, I think it needs to happen, uh, which just means we, we collectively have to sit down and do some work, and the sooner the better. And again, I keep saying that I, I think we should get down there. Okay, I'll start working. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get on it and try to put something together that we can present that makes sense, that we can all agree on on this end of the table, and present it to the folks on that side of the table, um, and see how it it shapes up, and obviously, you, you guys who have to deal with it at the transfer station, we need to make sure it's a system that you're comfortable with. I think it's time. Well, I, I know both of you gentlemen have worked down there for, for quite a while, done a great job, and I know you, you, you people really appreciate, uh, most people really appreciate what you do. So. Most of the people in the opinion are great people. But you, it's a little hand -tick. Want to push the envelope? <laughs> <laughs> so, one of, as, as a result of some of the stuff that yeah. the market had raised, I actually did some research this weekend. Yeah. 
looking at Effingham and Wakefield, Austin, Freedom, and Madison. Um, as has been pointed out tonight, we are the only town that does not charge for demo, couches, recliners, chairs, mattresses, box springs. Most everybody else does, and depending on the size of the load, it's a minimum of 30 to as much as $140 per load. So if you're pulling in a pickup truck and you're pulling in a trailer, that's two loads. The other thing um, that I found very interesting is, from a seriousness standpoint, uh, all but Effingham have a fine and fee schedule for violators. It was as high as three thousand dollars in one town. Most towns are five hundred to a thousand. First, second, third violation. There's an entire How process. How do they enforce that? Yeah. Well, there's an entire process they've got. A couple of the documents that I had pulled together, I actually took their entire policies for us to review and look at. It's spelled out in the in the policies. So it's one of those things where, um, as I agree with, with Mike, it's time to take a look at, uh, I'll call it a revenue offset to the 100% 100, 100 pure expense we have right now for the areas where people want to dispose of stuff beyond normal recycling and trash. It's time to take a look at it. So I'll be more than happy to dive in and start reviewing that and pulling together a draft document. And as Chuck has pointed out, other towns do have um, substantial written information uh, on policies, policies. procedures, yeah, I penalties. I don't think we should have it, something there we will. to hand out to people. We will. Right, some real stuff. the hand, the rules, and what it costs. Because a lot of people come in even today. Well, I didn't know how to pay for a washer or a dryer or, or a stove. Oh, well, yeah. Well, how long has that been in effect? A few years? Yeah, we have it on the... Yeah, you have it on the website. No, it's on the paper. We hang them, okay. yeah, them when they come in and get it. Yeah, a lot of people don't yeah. 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 read stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 a lot of people don't get on the website. Yeah. We'll take a look at it. Yeah. It's great that you brought it to the attention of the township. Thank you. Okay. Right now, all us taxpayers are paying for a few people that are abusing it. Period. That's correct. And it's got to end. Yeah. Well, it's got to end in a in a in a common 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 sense. Yeah, it's just not you know you just can't go like this and it's got to stop. No, you get to but you got to start stopping it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the next and that's what we're going to do. It's not going to stop tonight. It might stop not stop next week. We're going to come up well, with a common it might, it might be a process to go through. Because it's not like people don't have other options to get rid of demo. I, you know what? I hear that. And that's the one we went, this has been hashed through plenty of times. Right. And that's why it's got to stop now because all the hashing through hasn't done anything. Well, no. About well, the bulk stuff. Has. About the bulk stuff, John. Well, we're, yeah. we're, we're like with white goods and electronics yeah, right. and tires, yeah. those yeah. steps have you been gotta taken. You've got to crawl before you walk. And, you know, we, the town's always taking the position we, we, want to um, try and put out these services as best we can without incurring too much expense and such on, on people. But, you know, it's exactly. hit a point, and there are people that are using it way beyond what they probably should be. And so, you know, now it's prompting, you know, because Mark and, and uh, Bill are here, you know, making it obvious. And they haven't handled a lot, so. <clears throat> but, um, yeah. Ms. Fister. I was just going to say, we're not reinventing the wheel. No. Every no. other town has this. We're it gives that right. on. Right. <laughs> I know. But, right, but we, this is not like a new thing. No. And my suggestion, which you're not going to like, is in the springtime when everybody's dumping out all their heavy stuff and coming in, my husband, thank you, dear, uh, uh, bought two loads one day because I wasn't home. Um, I think you guys, the selectmen, used to be down there, like in the spring flush. If one of you, if you each picked a day when they're doing their heavy emptying out of the summer cottages and the carpets and all, were there to help deflect some of this. Because they don't get it. I've been there. They don't get any respect. And, and, you know, people just ride right over them verbally and do their thing. And I think it would really help in this instance, in the beginning of the spring and summer, if you guys could have a presence down there to say, yo, back it off. Two, two things. <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, you're not paid. I know you're not paid enough. No, no, number one is uh, 
Uh, we had mentioned several times here that we wanted to get down for many different reasons to the transfer station and, and put the time in. No excuse, it just hasn't right. happened. Uh, um, we we to, do try to touch base down there when we can, and it just didn't happen this year. We also usually, for Earth Day or whatever it's mm -hmm. called, here, try to bring in an extra dumpster. We didn't do that this year. Um, somehow well, we, we managed we to overlook. really need it in the end. Well, that's because probably it rained. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't have, but as a matter of practice, it's and, and like you say, there's that spring clean out that comes yeah, through. That's so the time that they can really use bringing in extra. one dumpster for one Fourth, yeah. time through. Um, so I agree with all of that, Carol. I also think that um, being provided the input from the, the employees at the transfer station on those who offend the situation. Um, and there's an actual active response from this office. I, I think some of that will self-correct, one should hope. Because at, at some point, if we're a small town, it's a small community, and word gets around, as much as everybody says they don't know anything about anything, word gets around pretty quick. So. But the action of having an actual consequence exactly. would be paramount. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, uh, again, I mean, I've, I know personally I've had the conversation a number of times this year with uh, Mark anyway, and as Chuck said, this, um, and he's got examples from uh, several of the surrounding towns as to what they they do and some policies to which they um, have incorporated in handling that. So this is not a, as John said, this isn't going to be over tonight. No, we're we're going to try and put some structure to the pay scales on this and to how to implement it with you guys. The accounting aspect of it with Claudia and, and Chuck for, you know, how, what are we going to do there for taking money, generating receipts so that DRA will be happy. Um, so that it's not a super quick process. It shouldn't be a, a horribly long. Like two or three months, four months. Well, I'd like to see it happen sooner than four well, months. Well, you know what I'm saying. And as far as the public goes, though, these things are done through a, have, a, have a public hearing part of a process. So certainly there would be room for input to come in on the subject. And, you know, certainly not everybody's going to get what they want. There's going to be a compromise in these areas. So. That's the big word, compromise. Yeah. Um, All right, that's about it, I guess. All right, that's good for both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.